introduce today's speaker. This is Dan Fu, who's visiting from Stanford, um, where he's a PhD student in the computer science department. Uh, he works on machine learning and systems with a focus on making machine learning more efficient, but I'm sure he's going to tell us about that himself. Uh, he's also published at a number of top machine learning venues, including Squirrel and Spotlight Talks at NeurIPS and ICML and iClear. Um, and another fun fact, if you go on his website, he's made really nice blogs explaining all of his work, um, which is super convenient and uh, helps make it more accessible. Um, so I'll leave it to you. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for having me. Thanks for that great introduction. Uh, so my name is Dan. I'm a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, my research is at the intersection of machine learning and systems. And today I'm uh, really excited to share with you a little bit about my work into uh, de developing new, more efficient architectures and, and new systems algorithms to, to make them work on modern hardware. Um, before we get started, there's kind of three ideas that I'd like to leave you with at the end of today's hour. Um, and, and the talk will be kind of split into three parts to, to cover these three ideas. So in the first part, we're gonna be uh, looking at what primitives can, can we use to replace kind of the current architectures, the current machine learning models that, that we use to, to train a lot of a lot of powerful algorithms today, like language models and things like that. And in that section, the technique, the idea that we're going to be using is something I like to call the unreasonable power of synthetics. So we're going to take some really complex learning problems like language modeling, and then we're going to try to boil them down to some really simple uh, synthetic examples. And we'll see how we can use those synthetic examples to make some progress, understand where are the gaps in our current techniques, and how can we improve on them for these complex learning problems. And the second part of the talk, we're gonna uh, turn a little bit more to the system side of things. And we'll be asking, how can we take these new primitives and make them really efficient on modern hardware? So the theme for the second part is something I like to call 20th century algorithms, 21st century hardware and applications. What that means is as we're developing these new machine learning algorithms and as hardware is changing, we actually need to go back and look at some really classical algorithms from the 20th century. So in this case, we're gonna be uh, looking at the FFT, the fast Fourier transform. And turns out there, we're gonna actually have to optimize it a bit more, even though that's an algorithm that we've known about, we've been optimizing since the 60s, because there's these, these new applications, we kind of have to take a second look at how we compute it today. And the third part of the talk, uh, I, I hope to show you how these two ways of thinking, this kind of machine learning way of thinking, the systems way of thinking, they're not two separate entities, but they're actually quite, quite deeply interrelated. So in particular, we'll see how the systems insights that we developed in the second part can actually inform the development of new machine learning primitives and help us get even more efficient models. Um, so, so that's kind of an outline of how the talk will go today. Uh, and of course, feel free to stop me at any time for questions, but also pause at, at a few places to take questions from the audience. So with that, let's, let's go ahead and jump into the talk. I wanna start by some with some really exciting motivation, some new models that have emerged in the past couple of years that, that can do some pretty amazing things. So today you can go to ChatGPT and ask it to do something like write a creative poem or debug your code, and it can do so with near kind of near human level accuracy. Or you can go to a service like Midjourney and ask it to generate these beautiful landscapes, the, these beautiful pieces of art, and can, it can uh, generate some pretty impressive pictures. Perhaps most excitingly, machine learning is starting to have an impact in the sciences. So with models like AlphaFold, that, that we, we can hope that maybe these, these new techniques are starting to have an impact. The sciences could maybe start to change the way that we, that we approach healthcare today. What my research is interested in is what has made these advances possible and how can we improve on them for the next generation? And one major driver of these capabilities has been scale. So an, an obvious axis of scale has been model size. Over the past four or five years, our models have grown from 100 million parameter BERT models to today their models are hundreds of billions or even a trillion parameters large. So with that scale and model size, there's, there's come with it some new, new capabilities, some of these things that, that I showed you in the last slide, the ability to, to generate human level text or analyze complex code, complex, complex inputs. But there's also been another really interesting axis of scale and that axis is context length or what is the amount of input that one of these models can take in in one go. So a few years ago when we started training these models and scaling them up, the maximum context length for, for, a, for some of these uh, best in the class models was something like 500 tokens or 500 words. That's about one page of text. That means if you wanted to analyze a document that was longer than that, you had to split it up and you, you couldn't really uh, reason about connections between over multiple pages of text. 
Today, that context length has grown to, to over a million. So Google's Gemini, I think 1.5 that they released a couple of weeks ago, uh, now has 1 million context length. So that brings with it some practical capabilities. You can now upload an entire PDF to some of these services. Uh, you can start analyzing high resolution images, but it's also starting to enable new long context modalities. So there are new modalities like DNA where the human genome is 6 billion base pairs long um, that, that are starting to come online because of some of these long context applications, things like video analysis were, were some of the, the key applications of, of these new long context models. The basic observation and thesis of my research is that efficiency is increasingly tied to quality in machine learning, whether that means, you know, if you have a more efficient training algorithm, you can train for more data or, or a larger model, or it means some of these new long context applications that are starting to come online. So because efficiency is so increasingly tied to quality, how can we improve the efficiency of the core primitives in machine learning? So what do I mean by core primitives? So here, this is a basic diagram of, of a transformer, which is a, kind of the basic architecture behind a lot of the advances today. And it's kind of composed of two core primitives. These are called attention and MLP. So these are great. They, they've led to a lot of the, the nice abilities and qualities that we've seen in the previous slides. But they both scale quadratically along one of these axes that we really care about. So for example, the MLPs will scale quadratically in the model with the model dimension of these models. Attention scales quadratically in the input length, the input length, that context length of the models. So that means that as we're trying to scale to longer sequences or as we're trying to make these models larger and wider, you the, the, the core efficiency of these primitives is going to become a scaling bottleneck. So how can we make these approaches more efficient? My research takes a blend of a machine learning and a systems approach to this problem. On the, okay. on the machine learning side, the question is really, how can we make a more efficient ML algorithm? So here, the ideas are inspired by things like signal processing or thinking in terms of reasoning, in terms of the asymptotic scaling of these algorithms. And like I said, using some simple synthetic examples to really try to understand what are these simple primitives doing. So on this side, I have work on things like data efficient training, training with weaker labels or, or less data, and improving some of the loss functions that we use to train some of these models. On the system side, we, we really think a little bit differently, and we ask kind of a different question, which is that given a particular machine learning alg algorithm, a particular primitive, how can we make it hardware aware to improve the runtime wall clock efficiency or the memory efficiency of these models? So here, the ideas will be things like tiling or scheduling using techniques like kernel fusion or roof line analyses to really understand where are the bottlenecks of, of some of these algorithms and thinking in terms of, you know, what are the IO characteristics of some, some of these techniques? Here I have algorithms for things like fast training and inference of transformer models, as well as other core primitives in machine learning. Today, I'm not going to focus so much on the ends of the spectrum, but, but kind of on the intersection. This is what I like to call hardware-aware efficient primitives. So this is both when we're going to be changing the fundamental primitives themselves, so replacing those attention and MLP operations with different primitives, and then also developing the systems-aware, hardware-aware algorithms to really realize the asymptotic gains of modern hardware. I'll briefly note that throughout my PhD, my work has been inspired by some key uh, applications, things like DNA modeling or video analysis, and I won't really dive into them too much today, uh, but when they come up, I'll try to just flash up the, this little symbol here, here to kind of indicate that this is one of those key motivating applications. Uh, I just also want to mention that we've been very fortunate that the style of research has seemed to be resonating with the community. So this, the, the ideas that you see in this talk, this blend of machine learning and systems, starting to have some real impact in industry. And today we're going to take a deep dive into three papers that capture the story, this, this blend of machine learning and systems. And the first two parts of the talk will be focusing on replacing this attention primitive. So we'll be trying to look for something that scales subquadratically in sequence length. First, we'll take a put on a machine learning hat, take a machine learning approach, try to see you know what is a replacement for attention that works well for language modeling. And we're going to be looking at a primitive called state space models, trying to reason about how can we get them to work for language. And the second part of the talk, we'll take the systems approach. We'll look at how can we make this new emerging class of models efficient on modern hardware. And turns out there the key is going to be optimizing the FFT, the fast Fourier transform. And the third part, we're going to switch gears a little bit. So we'll be expanding not just the attention, we'll also be looking at the MLPs. And we'll also, I, I'll, I hope to be showing you a little bit how these machine learning and systems approaches are actually quite intertwined. Instead of uh, doing them separately, we'll actually switch between them uh, quite, quite frequently. 
And and of course, at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll end with some exciting future directions that, that I like to take this style of work in this direction, these directions in, in the future. So with that, let's dive into the first piece and look how we started to design primitives to replace attention and language modeling. And here again, so the theme for this first section is, is going to be this idea, this unreasonable power of synthetics. And you'll see here we'll be designing these new primitives, uh, and you'll see how we can use some really simple synthetic languages to understand the key properties of some complex learning problems, and then use those ideas to improve the primitives that, that we use to train these models. So uh, to, to start off with some motivation, a couple of years ago, we, we started to get interested in this question of how can we get some subquadratic kind of uh, scaling in, in these language modeling um, in language modeling. And we, we were starting to pay attention to this new emerging class of primitives called state space models. So if you're not familiar with the, these primitives, they're kind of a mix between convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. The reason that that detail is important is because uh, what the convolution sign means is that during training, you can train them in n log n time in the sequence length n, so you get this nice subquadratic scaling. During inference, particularly for some of these language models, you get very fast generation, roughly O of one generation. Equally as exciting as these computational properties, these state-based models are starting to show state-of-the-art performance in a number of sequence modeling applications, so things like uh, speech audio generation straight from uh, audio waveforms or analyzing time, doing time series analysis uh, using GNNs. Um, and, and in all these cases, these state-based models were starting to show state-of-the-art performance. So our question was, okay, we have this new primitive. It seems to be high quality on sequence modeling. It has nice subquadratic properties. Can we get it to work for language? The challenge was when we took these, these primitives and just swapped them in for attention, we started to see some pretty big quality gaps. So here I'm showing you the performance of a transformer and then two state-based model, uh, two SSMs. Um, and I'm showing you a metric called perplexity. So in this metric called perplexity, lower is better. You can see in these models, there's about a five point gap in perplexity. For some context, that is roughly the difference between a 100 million parameter model and a 7 billion parameter model. So, um, uh, and, and here I've just asked two models of that size who Alan Turing is. You can see that the smaller model hallucinates that Alan Turing is the co-founder of Ethereum, whereas the larger model can kind of correctly you know, summarize that he was this influential mathematician uh, with, uh, with groundbreaking work in crypt cryptography and computer science. So, so this five point gap in perplexity is, is pretty bad in terms of quality. So our goal was we wanted to really understand and, and try to close this quality gap. Let me briefly tell you about my approach to how I like to approach problems like this. So once we've identified a promising new primitive, the, the next step is we want to take a deep dive and, and really try to understand the use case. In this case, we'll take a deep dive into language models and how transformers do language modeling. Once we have that, the next step, instead of doing something like just tweaking our primitives a little bit and, and trying to scale them up, uh, you know, boil the ocean, spend a lot of GPUs training these models, instead what we're going to do is we're going to design these really simple synthetics that are that are going to allow us to uh, that, that are going to allow us to both iterate faster and also fully understand some some key property of these uh, of these applications. And here we'll be looking at one called associated recall. That's going to, uh, some analysis of those synthetics is going to give us the insights to, to build a new, uh, a, a new solution and, and close some of those quality gaps, which will then go back and then actually scale up to, to some of these original language modeling tasks. So let's dive into that, that second part now and look at uh, the, the basic uh, idea behind language models and kind of how transformers do it. Let's see, I think I need to click this OK. All right, there we go. Um, so, so the transformer is, is the basic architecture behind of the lot, a lot of the models that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. The basic interface to how it works uh, is that you have some input that you'll split into a series of tokens. So, so here I have just put together a simple example here. Barack and Michelle Obama went to Harvard to visit their daughter. What the language model is going to try to do is it's going to try to take that input and predict what the next token that comes next. In this case, the language model will have seen enough data during pre-training to know that the Obamas have two daughters. One of them went to Harvard and her name is Malia. So Malia is probably the next token that, that comes next. The way that attention does this is that it will compare every, uh, every input, every token in that input to every other token in the input. So I've just animated this here. You can see that for each orange block, you need to do a dot product to comparison with each of these inputs. So because you have this all to all comparison, this is where you get the quadratic scaling of transformers and sequence length. 
the reason that, that this actually turns out to be useful, this brute force comparison, is that when you're trying to predict this next token, it's really useful to be able to go back and look at some of these tokens that came before um, and, and put together you know, some of the, these context clues to, to predict which token comes next. So now that we have this basic understanding, how can we get from, for example, this, this blue quadratic curve to one of these subquadratic curves, for example, the, these orange or red subquadratic curves? Like I mentioned, my, our, our approach here is we're going to be developing some really simple synthetics to try to capture some of the key properties of this language modeling problem. And, and so here was one that ended up being particularly useful for us. So this is called associate recall. So it's a really, really simple synthetic here. There's a really small vocabulary, say 20 tokens. Uh, you're going to have some, some of these tokens are going to be keys like A, B, C, and D. The other tokens like these numbers are going to be values, one, two, three, and four. In each sentence, you're just going to have a unique mapping between keys and values. And the task is really simple. So given a particular key at the end that doesn't have the value associated with it, the language model just has to go back and look up what is the correct value of that input. So this is a really simple task. You can probably solve it with a few lines of Python code and a hash function. And it certainly doesn't capture all the properties of language, but it captures one really interesting bit for these language models, which is that when you're trying to do this next token prediction, it's just really useful to be able to go back and recall information from earlier in the sentence in order to do this. More excitingly for us, when we took this really simple synthetic that you can solve the few lines of Python and try to train a state-based model to solve it, we saw a huge gap in performance. So here I'm showing you uh, accuracy on this simple synthetic task. These are really small models, simple kind of two-layer models. See that the transformer can solve it perfectly, while these state-based models really struggle uh, on this task. So the state-based models really lag behind transformers, even on this super simple synthetic. So what we did here is we literally tried to sit down and write out the weight. So try to figure out why is it the case that these state-based models that can do all these other sequence modeling tasks why can't it do this simple test? So what we did was we started writing out examples and writing out weights for these SSM models to try to solve this. So here I've just written out the, the, that same example from before. And what I've done is I've just gone ahead and I sort of uh, mapped each token in the input to some unique embedding. So, so here we're, we're kind of using a one-dimensional embedding. And I've, because the answer is ultimately going to be one, just for visual clarity, I've just indicated that with this very negative spike. This is going to be the output in green here. And the way that you can tell whether the model gets it correct is whether this last dot here uh, matches this green dot. So you can see in this example, we're actually going to be able to write out SSM weights that can actually solve this example. So because this green dot here matches this negative orange spike here, we are actually getting the right answer. The way that we did this is we simply wrote out a very simple filter. So this is kind of a signal processing view on these SSMs. And this filter you can see is mostly zeros, and there's just a, this one spike here. So when you take this convolutional training view and, and convolve this signal with this other signal, you can see that you actually get the right answer. So, so our first observation is that state-based model filters can actually solve this associative recall task for some, for some given examples. The challenge is this filter is now hard-coded into the weight. So if you do something as simple as just swap around the order of of two of these inputs here, and then you run that exact same state-based model through, you can see that you're going to get the wrong answer. So uh, the, the answer should still be this one. But now this green dot is now not matching up to this very negative orange spike here. What's going on is that this SSM filter that we hard-coded into the weights is now looking up kind of the wrong token. So the intuition about what these state-based models can do is that they can, uh, they're, they're, they're very good at kind of doing something like, I want to recall a token that I saw 10 tokens before or 20 tokens before or recalling something that came a fixed length before. But if you need to do this dynamic recall, uh, if, if you need to recall a different part of the input based on something that you see later, these state-based models really have, really struggle to solve them. So this, this kind of became our technical challenge. How can we enable this dynamic recall of previous tokens using these state-based models? But once we had this intuition, we were able to design you know, a pretty simple fix to do this. Uh, th this is the one that we, that we put forward initially. So this is something called gating. Uh, it's, it's a very simple idea. So the versions of this appear go back as far as the original LSTM paper. The idea is pretty simple. Each of these circles with dots in them, this is just going to be an element-wise gate, an element-wise multiplication of two vectors. What that's going to allow us to do is it'll allow us to kind of uh, uh, create these three projections of the input, and each of these can specialize to do something else. 
So what we are what we are able to do is we are able to write out weights again explicitly that could solve this problem. I'll just walk you through one example of weights that you can write down to, to solve this problem here. First, I'll point out that, that here, uh, the, these weights that I've written out, we're going to get the answer correct. So you can see at the bottom, the, the screen dot is going to match this orange shot. What's happening is that this first branch kind of acts just as a simple pass through of the current, the current token embedding. So this is exactly the same thing as I showed you on the previous slide. We can specialize one of these other branches to look out for particular keys in the input. And in particular, the, this, the second branch here is just going to check whether, you know, is the previous token going to be this particular key, this particular C token. So I'm going to going to light up when the previous token is a C. You multiply these two signals together, and now you get an embedding of this one token that only shows up after you've seen the C token. In this SSM, we're going to uh, initialize these SSM filters to kind of act as a global memory store. So when you take this signal convolved with this blue signal, you've now memorized the embedding. So you can see it's this very negative one embedding. You've now memorized it for the entire sequence. Finally, with, the, with this last branch, what we're going to do is we're just going to light up if the current token is the C. So previously, we were kind of detecting is this was an indicator with an offset. And now, now this is just an indicator of what the current token is. And what that's going to allow you to do is when you take this signal that memorizes the embedding of the one, and then you have this signal that only lights up when you have the C token, you put those together. Now, whenever you see the C token in the future, you're just going to go ahead and output, output this one embedding. So if you take the, this, the, these model weights that we've kind of written out by hand, then you do something like, like before, how we just switch around the order of the inputs, and then you run this system forward, again, you're going to get the right answer. So again, this green dot is going to match up with this orange dot. You can do something like you can switch around the key value mapping in this input. So here I've switched it from a one to a three. And now you can see that again, this matches. So here now there's kind of a slightly positive bump and you can see that this green dot matches again. So, so sort of the intuition is that these gates, these element wise gates are allowing for some simple selection properties of when we want to put a particular embedding in this SSM memory and when we want to take it out again. So we can show that this particular formulation that I've shown you here, uh, it can actually provably solve this associative recall problem with parameters that, that grow linearly with the size of the vocab. In later work in later papers, we can we can uh, let this scale to a sublinear scaling uh, kind of by doing a smarter mapping of, of tokens to, to the embeddings. Uh, it, it's not just that, that we can do this manually and theoretically when we go up ahead and and train these two layer models again. So you can see that this gated SSM, this H3 layer can, can nearly match transformers on the simple synthetic. And then when we take it back to the original language modeling task here, here I'm pre-training on a data set called the pile. I'm showing you perplexity again. You can see that the, these H3 models can match transformers on these upstream training metrics like perplexity. More exciting when we then go on to downstream tasks, a zero shot, few shot reasoning over benchmarks like, like super glue, you can see again that these H3 models where we replace um, the, the attention with these SSMs, with these gated SSMs can now match in terms of quality. I told you at the beginning of this section that SSMs also have this very nice recurrent view that allows for very fast generation. What this means is that now we can get much faster generation, especially for longer sequences. So here, when we will train convolutionally and then during inference, we'll flip to this RNN formulation, which allows us to get up to 2.4 times faster ge uh, generative inference. I'll briefly tell you a little bit about how this work has evolved and the impact it's, it's, had, on kind of, it's had on kind of the research here. So first, the, the synthetics have involved. People have taken the idea of this associative recall and kind of run with it and, and gone, gone farther. So there are more complex versions of associative recall that start to capture slightly more properties of language. Uh, when, when we decided we wanted to go take a look at Burt style models, we made a bi-directional version of this associative recall. Um, use, that, use that to develop some, some Burt architectures. So advances in these synthetic stuff often come hand in hand with advances in architectures. So we figured out how to replace these SSMs with convolutions. This is a model called Hyena. Uh, we we learned how to develop these BERT style uh, models. This is, uh, we called this one Monarch Mixer, hence why this, this little butterfly is mixing this drink here. Um, there have been more advances in state-based models. If you've heard of this recent model called Mamba, uh, it, it basically takes this gating and then also adds another mechanism in the SSM to do a little bit better selection. Um, so, so again, inspired by the insights from these associative recall tasks, uh, the, these new SSM models can, 
can uh, again have, have slight in, improvements in quality. As one kind of cute demo of, of how of, of how these models have evolved. So this is a model called Stripe Hyena. Uh, it's basically a scaled up version of that H3 architecture, scaled up to 7 billion parameters, um, and then also with some nice conversation tuning on top. So right before the talk today, I asked her, you know, I said, I'm giving this talk at Johns Hopkins to the computer science department. What is something nice uh, I can say about the department? Oops, wrong button. Uh, and you can see that that it generated the, the, this nice text about how Johns Hopkins is, is this nice interdisciplinary um, university with, with a lot of strong research. So this work has also applied to beyond language modeling. So even though we designed these models just with language modeling um, in, in mind, we, we have uh, since, uh, you know, folks have since been able to apply it to other modalities. Um, so here, the, this was one released, uh, I think, last week. Um, kind of, kind of a, the, these new DNA foundation models. So again, this is kind of a scaled up version of the H3 architecture, but trained on DNA data. These models are now able to do things like generate, uh, kind of predict generative structure, sorry, generate structures, um, the, the, these biological structures um, using these simple models. So as we bring this section, to, this section to a close, I just want to kind of briefly call out what happened here. So we took this really complex learning problem of language modeling where, where uh, the, the, the models today, the state of the art models are really quite complex. We don't fully understand how they operate in, in all their entirety. And we were able to boil it down to a really simple synthetic um, that, that allowed us to really un fully understand what was going on in some cases. And then we were able to use that uh, to, to get some insights about how to improve these models. And that led to improvements in quality and efficiency. With that, I'll, I'll briefly pause for some questions. Uh, a question or two about this section. Go ahead. Can you help? I, for example, I only saw previous tokens ever influencing this Yeah. Can you explain the leaps from that to mm -hmm. being able to tell? Yeah. So the uh, there's there 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 there's two things. So uh, there's uh, let's see. So the 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 thing for the. Um, so let, let me, so there, I think there's two ways to think about your question. So one is uh, in this version of associative recall, there's only kind of like pairs of like keys and value there, there. There's not really, there's not like a multi key token or, or something like that. Um, so, so there we, ha we have started to look into uh, kind of, you know, what if your, what if your keys in this associative recall are longer, like a bigram or a trigram? What if your values are a bigram or a trigram? And there we see mostly the, the same characteristics. So the intuition there is that uh, when you have particular bigrams or trigrams that, that appear often in your, in your training data, for instance, um, the, these SSM models are, are already very good at kind of learning that particular pattern. Um, so the, the, the key that we wanted to, to dive into for this associate recall is what if you have like some input and output that, that you don't know how far it'll be in, in your input. Um, so, so here that this was kind of developed to, to really just just dive into that. Um, and there's, you know, there, there's a lot of other properties of language that that, that we don't cover with this and that are like memorizing facts or memorizing particular associations. Um, what was interesting to us about this was that this seemed to be a property that was kind of necessary for language, um, but that these state-based models were were unable to do so. Uh, figuring out kind of how to close that particular, um, you know, necessary but not sufficient condition uh, ended up, uh, you know, um, uh, closing that, that that gap quite a bit. Was it part of your formulation of the AR problem that the relevant context had to be nearby? Had to be the immediate context? Like, I don't know. Could it have been hmm. several characters back? Yeah, so... Uh, Let's see. So the the particular one that I showed you would have needed that that um, that property. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, how far in the past you saw a particular key value mapping. It kind of will be able to memorize that for for the entire sequence. But the particular one that I showed you, uh, it, it it is kind of hard coded to only look one token um, in advance. Yeah. All right. So with that, we'll move on to the second part of the talk. So in this part, we're going to kind of put on a systems hat. Ask the question. So, as we're developing these new machine learning primitives, uh, as we're kind of changing the computational profile of the models that we run, how can we make them hardware efficient? And, like I mentioned, the key here is going to be optimizing the FFT. And, kind of what we'll see is that 
uh, even though you have some of these algorithms like the FFT that have been around for decades, you know, 60 odd years, as you're getting these new use cases, as hardware is changing, we actually need to kind of take a second look at how we compute them. So the motivation for this work was that uh, the, there was this emerging class of new models that we call long convolutional models. So this includes some of the SSMs that, that I showed you before, but also includes models like Hyena. Uh, there's other models you may have heard of like RWKV or, um, or Meta has a model called Mega that, that all kind of have this convolutional view. One of their, uh, what they all kind of had in common is that they were state of the art in these long context, they were increasingly state of the art in long context applications they had a nice subquadratic scaling with the FFT. And they all kind of computed these convolutions in the same way. So using something called the FFT convolution. What that means is that uh, these convolution filters were very long. And instead of, uh, instead of using something like a PyTorch Conv1D to compute them, what they would do is that they would take a FFT of the input and of the kernel, do a pointwise multiplication, and then take the inverse FFT. So this is something called the FFT convolution theorem. So if you're familiar with FFTs, at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, great. So the FFT is probably the most optimized operation on the planet. You know, it's got this nice divide and conquer and log in algorithm. People have called it the most important numerical algorithm of our lifetime. There's a ton of applications. I bet this thing is going to be super optimized in hardware. I can just take some off the shelf, for example, in video library and run it super fast on GPUs. Fortunately, there was just one problem, which was we were observing a, a gap in runtime performance. So what I'm showing you here is flash attention in red compared to kind of a FFT convolution using NVIDIA's best kind of QFFT, uh, best QFFT libraries. What we were finding was that the FFT convolution was slower than flash attention in a lot of cases. So if you get to very long sequences, the asymptotic scaling kind of takes over, but for these shorter sequences, particularly sequence like 2K, where today we're spending a lot of our cycles pre-training language models, uh, there, there's this big gap in runtime performance. So our question was, okay, how can we take this, this new important emerging class of, of operations and how can we make it fast? I'll briefly break down my approach to how I like to tackle systems problems like this. So first, when we've identified a new promising primitive like these FFT convolutions, the next step is we like to go and analyze the hardware, really try to understand what are the key hardware bottlenecks for this operation. Using the insights there, we'll be able to go and uh, develop a new, more efficient solution. In this case, we're going to be developing one called Flash FFT Comp, which will then be able to go back and use that to speed up the speed up the primitives. So, so let's dive into kind of the hardware bottlenecks of the FFT convolution on modern hardware. So really, there, there's going to be a couple bottlenecks. Uh, the, the first is what's called a memory bottleneck. So on, on modern accelerators, including GPU, there's something called a memory hierarchy. Um, so if you're familiar with, with kind, of, uh, kind of CPUs, you can think of the HBM as, as your old DRAM, the, the SRAM, or HBM as what you would have you know, previously considered disk kind of, and NASRAM what you would have previously considered kind of relatively fast DRAM. Um, and when you write out an FFT convolution like this, uh, between each step, it requires a full round trip between kind of the fastest bits of memory and and this and this HPM. So this HPM on a GPU is kind of what you think of as GPU memory when you type in NVIDIA SMI, it says you have 40, 80 gigabytes. And because each of these operations requires a full round trip between these registers and HPM, this FFT convolution, when you just sort of implement it directly, incurs these expensive IO operations. If you're familiar with optimizing ML operations, the first thing that you might try is something called kernel fusion. So what this means is you kind of put your CUDA hat on and you go and implement a custom FFT convolution operation. Uh, and instead of putting the intermediates on HBM, you customize it and put it onto a faster uh, bit of memory like, like this SRAM. So this was indeed the first thing that we tried, but we actually found that we ran into an SRAM limitation. So what that means is that as we're trying to scale to these longer sequences for these longer convolutional models, um, we, we really ended up being limited by SRAM size. So we couldn't fit the entire sequence into the smaller but faster, um, the smaller but faster uh, you know, layer of the memory hierarchy. So in other words, we we're finding that kernel fusion was really bottlenecked by SRAM size. When we did this kernel fusion, we also found surprisingly that there was a bit of a compute bottleneck. Now you may find that a little bit surprising because the FFT is one of the sort of one of the most flop light 
um, operations that we have today. And GPUs are some of the most flop heavy devices that we have. So, so let me walk you through a simple roof line analysis so you can see where, where are we finding this compute bottleneck. So first, this blue dot is what happens when you, when you just compute an FFT convolution using PyTorch or a cool FFT. You can see that it's under the slowest part of this curve, which means that it is entirely IO bound. Um, it, it's entirely bound by those communication between uh, registers and HBM. When you do kernel fusion, you get this orange dot. And now you're under this flat part of this curve, which means that this kind of pretty flop light operation is now going to be compute bound. You don't have enough flops to compute it. So what's going on there? So it turns out on modern hardware, modern uh, GPUs like A100 or H100, uh, there are specialized compute units that you need to use in order to get the full compute capabilities of the device. So on GPUs, these are called tensor cores. They're specialized matrix, matrix, multiply units. Uh, so for example, on A100, H100, they can, com they can compute a matrix multiply 16 times faster than, than general arithmetic operations. So in terms of this roof line, if you can use the tensor cores, it will, uh, you end up raising the roof line um, and, and enabling higher, uh, enabling kind of more flops, more compute. What we're going to do with Flash FFT Conv is we're going to uh, kind of take the FFT operation and change the way that we compute it to be able to exploit these tensor cores. And we'll be able to move to this much nicer part of the roof line diagram. So let me tell you exactly how we do this with Flash FFT Conv. So the basic idea is we're going to take that nice divide and conquer algorithm, and we're going to stop the recursion of that uh, algorithm early. So I've just written kind of what that looks like from a matrix standpoint. You can imagine that these dense blocks are, uh, you can replace them with FFT weights. What this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to take that FFT pointwise inverse FFT operation and replace the, the FFT steps with these matrix multiply operations. So, so these Fs represent matrices. You can see where we're just going to matrix multiply interleave with some, with some pointwise operations. So the first thing that we're going to do, so we call this a monarch decomposition. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go and write ourselves a custom CUDA kernel to compute as much of this on SRAM as we can. I told you before that one of the bottlenecks was this limited SRAM size, but here this particular monarch decomposition also gives us a way out. So if we need to scale to a longer sequence length than if it's an SRAM, what we can do is we can compute part of the operation and, and store the intermediates on HBM, but those parts of the operation, the, those, those initial, the, the, the part of the beginning and the end is also going to be very efficient. So it's just, just going to translate to a single matrix multiply operation. So again, we're going to be able to use these very fast tensor cores to compute these operations. And then all this stuff in the middle, all, all these other operations, we can still use our custom CUDA kernel um, to compute them very quickly. So this decomposition allows us to reduce the SRAM footprint as we're going to longer sequences. So one of the reasons that we did this is that it allows us to uh, translate these FFT operations into these matrix multiply operations. So now we've, we've taken this operation, we've mapped it onto tensor cores and NVIDIA GPUs very nicely. I'll dive one level, uh, one level deeper in, in, uh, in detail real quick, which is that the particular way that we've written out these multiply operations, you'll see that the Fs kind of on the left and the right, there's some transposes here. The particular way that, that we've written this is we can actually exploit the, the particular way that tensor cores work on NVIDIA GPUs and minimize communication between SRAM and register. So uh, all these, the, these first three steps of this algorithm all happen directly within registers. Uh, if you're familiar with CUDA, this translates to a bunch of kind of WMMA sync operations without any load or stores from SRAM. So, so we're actually going to be IO aware even one level deeper um, than I showed you before. The upshot of all of this is that we can make the FFT convolution a lot faster. So that's going to be this green curve that I'm showing you here. You can see that we close the gap to flash attention, and we see up to 7.9 times speed up over NVIDIA's most optimized libraries, kind of kind of the PyTorch libraries that that you take if you if you run this this FFT convolution um, naively. This results in some major end-to-end -end speed up. Um, so we we can speed up all these new new convolutional models. Uh, we have a lower memory footprint, so we can scale to longer sequences. Uh, and now Flash FFT Conv is used in a bunch of these emerging gated SSM gated convolutional models. So things like the text generation model I showed you earlier, or some new SSM-based diffusion models, some of these new DNA foundation models that are starting to emerge. And as we conclude this section, I'll just come back again to this key idea. Um, so uh, what we what happened here is that as we're kind of uh, starting to, to, to look at these new applications, these new use cases, we actually need to go back and take a second look at the, 
at the classic algorithms that, that, that we started to develop in the previous century and questions. Yeah, I won't go down the well of the sure. factory before I talk. So, no, next one. This one. So, so if you're changing the computational intensities of this, mm -hmm. you need to prevent memory transfers from system memory. Yes. And so I see how you're changing, reducing operations to SRAM with register allocation, but yep. I don't mm -hmm. see where you're getting a order of magnitude reduction in, in uh, off-chip bandwidth. And did, yeah, can you give me some intuition there? Yeah, so 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 the key thing that that's kind of happening, um, so so there it kind of comes comes back to 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 this instance. So uh, the 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 key thing is, so if you're in let's call it the, this situation where your sequence is short enough, you can put kind of the entire thing into SRAM. And now uh, now uh, when you're kind of training a, a model, usually so it will be in this HBM that that I don't have shown here. So your input will be on HBM. Now with one of these kernels, you just need to load up the input once, do your full convolution, and then and then write it back out once you have the output. Uh, when you go to, to this next slide, so this is when we're kind of going to sequence lengths longer than 32K up, up to a few million. Um, now uh, you, you end up doing roughly kind of three IOs of your, of your input and output. Uh, so first here, first here, and uh, kind of do, do this matrix multiply and a point-wise put it onto HBM, load up the input, do your fuse kernel, and then uh, write that out to HBM and then do it one more time. Does that does it kind of make sense or or you? Yeah, we'll, we'll take this later. But okay. It seems like you need to scatter the output I/O. Well, ah, okay. So yeah. I, actually, I can answer later. that super quickly, which is that uh, the this matrix is large enough that that we can actually load up the input in uh, the the cache lines are actually a nice enough size that that this is a pretty nice I/O um, operation here. Um, that that's kind of a hint to the answer. I think I know what you're getting at, but but we'll we'll go over it more offline. All right, jumping forward. All right, so so now we'll we'll move on to kind of kind of the third part of the talk. Um, and here I'll briefly show you uh, how the these two ways of thinking, kind of this machine learning way of thinking, the systems way of thinking, um, are actually quite deeply connected and interrelated to each other. And the theme for this section is going to be that the systems insights that we developed before can actually go on to inform the ML primitives that we want to be developing. Kind of the cartoon version of this is, is instead of having a separate diagram for the machine learning development for the systems development, they're actually quite interrelated. It's actually kind of more of this, you know, figure eight web where we're developing these new primitives. We're looking at the hardware properties that's going to inform the development of the new primitives. And then we're going to go and see, does this work for particular applications, particular uh, use cases that we care about? And the basic idea here is going to come back to this monarch decomposition from the last section. So the basic idea ends up being pretty simple. So instead of having these dark blue blocks just be FFT weights, we can have them be fully learnable. We call these kind of monarch matrices. So this kind of generalizes the FFT operation. So from a hardware standpoint, from a system standpoint, this maintains the efficiency, all the nice benefits that we saw in the previous section. But from a machine learning standpoint, it's going to add expressivity. It's going to increase the, the, the types of transforms that we can that we can express. So in particular, we're going to be able to capture a lot of structured linear transforms. I've just shown a few of them here. In this third work, this third work monarch mixer, we're going to take this idea. We're going to really run with it and see how far we can go. So we're going to take these monarch matrices, then use them to replace both attention and MLPs in transformers. This will allow us to have an architecture that's going to start to scale subquadratically in both sequence length and and the model dimension, and it's and and because this and this primitive is, is still going to be nice and hardware efficient. This will allow us to match transformer quality with fewer parameters, fewer training flop flops, up to nine times faster wall clock time for longer sequences. Briefly, this is kind of what those architectures look like. So we replace the attention with kind of a you know a version of these gated SSMs that I showed you before. On the MLP side, we're going to replace the dense linear layers, with these block diagonal or, or monarch matrices. So in our paper, we go and we, we, we take this applied to BERT models, vision transformers, and kind of GPT models. We'll just go over the BERT, the BERT results for time. But the basic way that you evaluate a BERT model is you kind of pre-train it, and then you fine tune it on, on a benchmark application. So here, what we've done is we you know, took, a, took a standard transformer-based BERT model, uh, fine tuned it on blue. Then we took this, this M2 BERT, we call this uh, monarch mixer BERT. Um, you can see that we can match glue performance with fewer parameters. So, so we're saving in terms of, of, of those MLP parameters, but we can still match in quality. 
We see a similar story when we scale up to BERT large, um, but the, the, the real takeaway is can, we can kind of imagine quality with fewer parameters and fewer flops. Because we're also scaling subquadratically in sequencing, well, we can now uh, scale much better to long sequences. So uh, you see these transformer-based models, when you go to long sequences, you see a major hit in throughput um, for, uh, for these M2 models. As we get to these longer sequences, uh, we don't see nearly the same hit in throughput. So uh, it, if you, uh, as you get to longer sequences, you see, see more speed up over these, uh, these transformer-based models, up to kind of nine times speed up at sequence length 4K. So we started to use these models to train up some long context retrieval models. So this is some work that we put out, uh, I wanna say uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, so these are some kind of new retrieval models that, that can start to encode very long documents. You can see that this little dot in the top right, um, this 80 million parameter model can actually outperform much larger models like the 7 billion parameter model on this long context benchmark called LOCO. So even though we put this out uh, this work pretty recently, we started to see usage of the model uh, kind of in RAG applications and in, in embedding services. Uh, we, we've also surprisingly seen some, some uptake of the benchmark. So even before we put the archive out, people were already starting to use, to use the benchmark to try to evaluate their new long context embedding models. And that, that kind of brings me uh, to a close to this super short section. But here, uh, I, I just hope you, you, you've seen how if we take these systems insights and kind of co-develop them with the ML primitives, uh, we, can, we can get better quality and efficiency gains. Um, and that these two ways of thinking are, thinking are actually really quite intertwined with each other. Before I uh, move on to future work here, I'll, I'll briefly tell you about um, some other things that, that I've had um, some fun working on. So the first bit is uh, kind of don't forget transformers. So I talked to you a lot about these next generation models today. Um, but, but transformers are still a very popular architecture with, with a lot of use cases. Um, so here I, I've had some fun kind of developing systems algorithms to improve their training speed um, or, or developing specialized solutions for, uh, to improve their inference of, of generative inference, kind of things like FlexGen and Hydrogen. Beyond model architectures themselves, data is also a very important aspect of training these models. Um, so here, uh, the, this red pajama effort, this is one that I, that, I, uh, that, that I helped put together. So this was the kind of, we wanted to collect a very large kind of trillion token data set to be able to train some of these, these large language models in the open. So our goal here was a few years ago, all these closed models like GPT-4 were starting to come out. We were a little bit worried that, um, wait, the, the screen just went dark, but okay, still there. Um, and we were a little bit worried that, that you know, that these, uh, that, that the open source models may not be able to catch up. So we put together this large data set. And since then, you know, it's been used to train a number of open source models. And today the best open source models are roughly about a year behind uh, the, the best closed source model. So, so there's, you know, positive signs for the open source here. Now I'll talk about some of the future directions I'm really excited about and kind of how I want to continue using the takeaways and processes that I've shown you a little bit about in this talk to continue pushing the boundary at the intersection of machine learning and systems. So first direction is developing new efficient primitives. And a major focus here is gonna be continuing to, continuing to look at kind of more efficient ways to, to replace this MLP layer. We saw with Monarch Mixer, we could take some, some initial ideas. I'll characterize this as kind of maybe the first steps towards replacing this MLP with something more efficient. So we've seen kind of a 25% savings so far my feeling is that we might be able to get to something like an order of magnitude savings in parameters and training flops. If we can really understand how these MLPs work, how they're storing particular key value associations, particular facts. Along those similar lines, I'm really interested in building hardware aware uh, kind of algorithms for, for other classic primitives in machine learning. So things like Gaussian processes or wavelets. So these are really interesting primitives that have state of the art performance in a number of applications that have asymptotically efficient algorithms. But if you just take these, some of these and implement them uh, using PyTorch, sometimes they, they may not give you the speed up that you expect. Um, but if we can, I think if we can develop some of these hardware aware algorithms for these, um, we, we might be able to you know, give, give some of these ideas you know, a, a second life um, and, and make them really bloom on today's hardware. Along those lines, this, a second direction that I'm quite excited about, something that I like to call broadly kind of hardware, ML systems, compilers, e code design. What I mean by that here is, so this is the cartoon image uh, that I showed you about how I like to do systems work. 
And really there, there's a fourth step that I'm not showing you in this diagram. And this is something that I like to call grad student tiers. So between kind of analyzing the hardware, under, understanding the bottlenecks and developing the solution, there's a fourth, there's another step, which is a lot of blood, sweat and tears goes into building these efficient CUDA kernels to really exploit the hardware in the right ways. So in my opinion, there, there's a really interesting opportunity here to, to ask what are the right systems abstractions? You know, what is the right DSL or the right compiler so that it can be a lot easier to, to develop this so that the, the iteration time between having an, an idea for a new algorithm and developing new kernels is not, is not months of kind of grad student time, but rather uh, weeks or days or, or maybe even hours. And lastly, I'm really excited to dive into new long context scientific applications. So we've started to see how, how some of the new primitives that we've developed can start allowing us, allowing us to start to train some of these new models like these DNA foundation models. But I'm really interested to ask the question, you know, what new capabilities do, do these actually offer for us? What, what can they allow us to do that we didn't know how to do before? Or how can we take some of these, these new models that are already starting to have impact and, and develop more efficient algorithms for them? So th this is you know, a, a cartoon diagram for, to represent AlphaFold. What you may not know about algorithms like AlphaFold is that they actually scale cubically in the sequence length. So um, the, they, they scale to kind of end, end to the third um, in, in, uh, in, in the sequence length. So forget about all these subquadratic algorithms. Is it possible to take some of these ideas and develop more efficient uh, ways to do protein folding, for instance. So, so kind of coming back to those three themes from the beginning of the talk, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, I hope to leave you with these three ideas. So that first, if you're trying to develop some of these new primitives, these new machine learning ideas, uh, it's really useful to be able to go into really simple classical synthetics and use these to try to understand some key properties about what's happening. That as you're developing these new primitives and as hardware is changing, uh, it's really use, uh, you really need to kind of take a second look at how we compute uh, and how we look at classic algorithms like the FFT. And lastly, that these systems and machine learning ways of thinking, the, these two kind of, uh, the, these two ways of thinking are actually quite intertwined and that they can inform each other in critical ways. And if you do so, you can get uh, you, you know, even better things in, in quality and efficiency. And with that, thanks so much for listening today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, happy to take further questions. Uh, uh, I think I saw your hand first. Um, one of the things uh, that I can actually provide uh, alternative to that that not only they it maintain the same amount of quality and it's for the of transformer, mm -hmm. but then they also do say a bit of complexity. Mm -hmm. But then before the end of your time, you went back to Kessel and the regular transformer. Mm -hmm. So why is it that what you have proposed, why is it that they haven't been able to take over this transformer with uh, fever? Because it seems like they have the quality yeah, so so this is a great question. So I have two answers. So the first is uh, we're academics. We can play both sides. <laughs> so I, I think that that's you know one of the nice things about um, you know being an academic, you can you, you can optimize transformers one day and then go and say uh, we don't need them the next. So so that that's partially the the answer. the The other thing is um, so I I often get this question a lot, which is kind of are these state-based models, are these new architectures, are they gonna kind of replace transformers? Um, and I'd, I'd like to imagine a future where, uh, you know, there, there's not just one model. I think for the past four or five years, we've had kind of one architecture, one model that everybody uses for everything. Today, I'd say we have maybe like one and a half or like almost two where you have transformers, you have these new emerging classes of models like state-based models. I'd like to imagine a future where there's maybe five or 10 of these um, all with, you know, maybe different scaling characteristics, different different applications. So, uh, you know, maybe similar in some ways to, you know, the, the old deep learning days when maybe not where there's kind of a new architecture every week, but at least um, where there's, you know, a, a better, you know, a, a broader feeling or, you know, a broader, uh, you know, more choices available. Um, for transformers in particular, you know, there, there's a lot of kind of software buy-in, a lot of 
uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure built for them. You know, there are people who are trying to develop hardware just specialized for transformers. So for that reason, they have a lot of inertia. But uh, I think, um, and, you know, maybe I won't, <laughs> I won't say this so much on the public recording, but I think that there are places. So, you know, these these new applications where these, these alternatives to transformers are already kind of the only thing that you do. Um, depending on who, who you ask, there might be some evidence of, that some of the the big models trained by some of these kind of LLM companies may may not be you know transformers or they may may be some mix. Um, and I will speculate a lot more uh, in private without without recording. Go ahead. Thank you for the great talk. And I wanted to ask about the middle part. The, mm -hmm. the, um, yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a huge improvement, which is amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's and it's an improvement over the Nvidia implementation, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So. But they know how to do group line analysis. Mm -hmm, they know mm -hmm. what the tensor cores are. It, yeah. Was that an application specific insight that you had? I didn't understand if that was the case. Yeah. So the, the key there is uh, actually going to be that. Uh, so one property of the FFT, because it has so few flops, is that uh, if you just have one FFT by itself, you are on almost any modern hardware, you're always going to be completely IO bound. So that means that if you're NVIDIA, if you're FFT, if you're the who FFT team, and we actually talked to them a bit about this, your goal is kind of to make the fastest single FFT operation that you can have. Um, and in that case, it kind of doesn't matter how you compute it as long as you kind of do it right um, and, you, and you kind of engineer it right. There are many different operations that will all get exactly the same speed, which is just the amount of time it takes to read and write your, your output. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, there are, when you put it into a convolution, for instance, and then you put like a point-wise multiplication on one side or, or, or something like that, then you need to start moving some of these other operations in. And then uh, that then it ends up changing the compute to, to IO, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, ratio. And, and then you need to start thinking about how to use tensor cores and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's something about how operations are chained together. Exactly. Or applications that needed their supposition. So exactly. if they were to make a better library, they absolutely could adopt your approach. Mm -hmm. In other words, your approach is not specific to your yeah. application. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you have like an FFT followed by something else, followed by another FFT, followed by something else, yeah. then approaches like this would be would be quite promising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to follow that real quick, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so people that are doing like Einsum fusion, mm -hmm. FFT doesn't fall into this because it's not yes. an Einsum expression. And so you're doing the same type of fusion that you're seeing across mm -hmm. multiple operations. Really cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Exactly. The correct understanding? Uh, Close enough? Yes, I think uh, I think so. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the efficient surface modeling has been very popular for many years. It could be lower than FFT. Mm -hmm. For Mercy and the alternatives like and the Zaps. But, uh, but I also observe that most of the state of state of the art models, open models, are vanilla transformers without any tricks. The only exception I see is Mistral with a sliding window. So I don't know if you can observe the gap between the industry and the academia. Mm -hmm. And if there is a gap, why is there a gap? So uh, there's so there there's a couple parts to this question. So I think there, there there's two interesting bits. So one is you're right, there's been a lot of these kind of efficient attention things for a few years now. Um, up until I'd say a few months ago, um, and depending who who you ask, like maybe last week, um, there there there's always been a little bit of a quality gap, a quality lag between kind of full attention and some of these these efficient um, transformers. So up until any, uh, about a year ago, there, there was a little bit of a quality gap. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of these algorithms were sort of not I/O aware in the right way. So you would take one of these efficient attentions, then you would run it compared to like flash attention, you'd see a big gap in runtime. So you have a model that maybe doesn't have the same quality gap and then also um, might be a bit slower. So then that, that kind of hinders adoption. Um, so, so there's been this, this lag a little bit up until you know relatively recently, has it been the case that um, uh, you, know, you would actually seriously consider you know, spending you know, six months training one of these models on kind of trillions of tokens. Um, in that new regime, in the past few months, uh, so for like a brief amount of time, that striped hyena model was kind of like the best 7 billion parameter model uh, up until, you know, Mistral ha had another run going. I think what we're seeing right now is that most of these architectures are about the same in quality. 
Um, and uh, maybe some of them will be a little bit better than others, uh, but it really depends on kind of how much uh, training data you pour into it. So uh, it really depends on having some entity say, okay, we're, we're gonna really spend, you know, a lot of, you know, spend the time to train up a 7 billion parameter model for 8 trillion tokens or, or whatever it is. Um, I think those models are being trained uh, and we, we might see a few of them come out uh, in, in the next couple months that, that uh, could, could be competitive or, or, or close to, to matching some of these best models. Go ahead. At the start of that answer, you said it until last week. Are you referencing Griffin? The, like, yeah, so linear. Yeah, okay. yeah. So linear attentions until roughly last week had this big gap. As of last week, the, the linear attention models are, are now better. Uh, the SSMs closed the gap sometime last year. Um, yeah, so uh, Griffin, a, a lot of the times uh, what you'll see in these papers is that when you're trying to develop a new architecture, you want to kind of show that there's promise before going up to something saying like, hey, give me $2 million of compute to go trade this model. Like you, you want to show something first. So oftentimes you'll show a, a initial scaling plot. So those Griffin, we're trying on like 300 billion parameter models that, that are competitive to the best transformers with that same amount of data. Um, the implication being, if you want to then go and spend the money to train for seven, eight, whatever trillion tokens, you would expect that the performance would still hold. Yes. How does the optimization process differ in the case of dated Monarch SSM? And the common uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, for the monarchs in particular, because we because we designed them with this with this very specific goal, which is to mimic this exact FFT operation, uh, in in some cases you can literally use the the exact same code. Um, you just need to you know, you know swap out the place that you said this is where the FFT weights were. Now now put them in for your learned weights. Um, there's another there there's another part about the parameter efficient fine tuning approaches. So I've seen a couple places where, where folks have taken, uh, they're kind of kind of uh, you know orthogonal approaches. I've seen a couple places where people have taken ideas like this and, and applied some um, Laurel style Laurel style things. I think you know there's approaches like quantization, parameter efficient fine tuning things. Um, and these are you know orthogonal approaches. And I'd expect that if you put them together, um, uh, they they can they can also be a, be applied together in various ways. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and 